Oh, good morning, and thank you for joining us for this Igloo Aluna uh, Town Hall presentation and discussion on linked data in discovery. What is possible, what is needed, and what needs to change? Sorry. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Ken Varnum, uh, Senior Program Manager at the University of Michigan Library and a member of the Linked Open Data Working Group. And I'm very pleased to moderate this panel discussion uh, today. Um, as we get going, I'd like to remind everybody that to please mute yourselves uh, unless you're speaking during the question and answer period at the end. Uh, the session is being recorded for the benefit of uh, those who were not able to make this time of day or otherwise unable to attend or want to go back and relive the good times. Um, we're going to start today with a brief overview of the Igloo Iluna Linked Open Data Working Group, and then we'll move into our three panel presentations, which will go in turn. That will be followed by uh, questions and answers. Uh, there is a Google Doc um which i am putting the link to in the chat and please feel free to add things to that as the presentation goes on or at the end we will also use the zoom chat feature uh which depending on your which uh, what, what kind of device you're using is the little chat bubble um feel free to type questions in there uh, we'll go through the Google Doc first and then go through the chat and I'll uh, pose questions. And then if there's time at the end and anybody wants to, you know, wants to follow up on a question or add to the discussion, please feel free to uh, uh, unmute yourself uh, and ask. If things get a little bit uh, too discussion oriented, I'll ask people to raise hands and we'll go try to go in turn just to keep the conversation flowing. Uh, so. Uh, with that, um, I will pass it over to Xiaoli to talk briefly about the Linked Open Data Working Group and its role in the Ex Libris universe. Xiaoli? Thank you, Ken. Can you hear me? Good. Um, good morning, good evening, everybody. Well, depends on where you're from. And so I'm very glad to see many of you are interested in our uh, second town hall meeting. You may remember we had one back in um, December last year was more about transition from a mark to bib frame and then from bib frame to mark. So following that uh, very successful meeting, we thought this one we, we were focused on discovery. Um, in case you don't know, this working group is a joint group of Igloo and Iluna users community. So our focus is basically helping and advocating um, the building the linked open data features into AMA or other Exlibris products. So, so far we have been working with you and collect your user story um, and use cases and also um, work with other exlibris users group <clears throat> to collaborate basically the effort to help develop the linked open data. So we are basically um, is a group, hopefully working for you. So if you have any needs, any sort of thoughts, please feel free to share with us. So we can at least help to convey those suggestions to either other working groups or to Exlibris directly if it's appropriate. Um, we have several communication channels. So since you join us, I assume you probably are on our uh, list serve. But in addition, we do have a website and occasionally we do put some updated information there. And most importantly, we would like you to send your linked, linked data user stories or your user um, cases. So I think with that, I'm just very excited. We have a very um, three excellent speakers today. We'll talk about their user stories and what they have done 
and in helping their patrons to discover the information. With that, I'm turning to Ken. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce our three speakers and then turn them over, uh, turn the, the microphone over to each of them in turn. Um, our first presenter is TJ Cao, who is the head of metadata creation at UC Davis. Before UC Davis, he worked for numerous libraries, including Yale, George Washington University, Multnomah County Library, and the University of Connecticut. While he spends most of his time dealing with Mark 21 data, he has been exploring incorporating more linked data in his daily catalog. Our second presenter will be Steve Meyer, who is the data strategist for the University of Wisconsin Madison Libraries. In this role, he works on a range of data projects from library policies for data and data governance, as well as technical projects like the linked data implementation that he's going to be showing us today. And last, but certainly not least, Katie Lamb is the Associate Director of Library Services and Head uh, Systems and Digital Services at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology Library. This library has a few linked data projects involving Alma, Primo, Chinese Name Authority, Institutional Repository, and Digital, digital Scholarship. KT is the architect behind all of these initiatives. He is also a member of the Igloo Iluna Linked Open Data Working Group, which as Charlie noted, advises Ex Libris on implementing linked data capabilities. Now I'll stop sharing and pass it on to TJ. Let me unmute myself. Well, good morning again, and thanks, Ken, for the very nice introduction. And my topic for today, for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about the case of uh, identify, uh, identification of a work expression manifestation in Primo. And a disclaimer first, I, I feel like I'm a little bit embarrassed because I don't think we really do too much at UC Davis yet, but I definitely, this is more like my wish list with the possibility of what I see in Primo. And, <clears throat> oh, I should just do a present mode. That would be better. <clears throat> so what triggered this, uh, this kind of discussion is mostly because um, when I was uh, still at my previous institution, I, I submit a case, a use case about um, why linked data would be awesome to put in OMA and why experience should, you know, should go forward and do something with it. And because at that time, George Washington University has been doing lots of embedding URI work. Uh, the, at that time, the, the leader of the catalogers has been working really hard, you know, using mark edit so uh, to really uh, include the URIs for all the access points. So it becomes kind of daily routine for the, the catalogs at the GW. So awesome. at that time, I thought, well, so that's something that might be might be easier, you know, for us to explore. So one of the things that we think about is that, uh, yeah, so as a scholar, we can imagine that one of the things that they had to deal with is usually lots of kind of going for, especially for humanities, probably specific like literature scholars, they really want to know lots of addition, lots of translation, all different kind of things like that. So I think there might be something that uh, catalogers can help or maybe our discovery layer can help to really um, fill that need. So I'm going to next slide. And so this is a kind of withering high, you know, the very classic that everyone loves. I hope also very, very sad, but it's also a very great story. So out of curiosity, as an example that I search and use the uh, UC Davis Supremo VE and just search it. And it turns out I got a result. And this is just the first seven uh, seven, yeah, seven results from the first page. Of course, there are a lot of pages, but first of all, and this is the kind of result. And yes, like, you know, uh, yeah, Primo is a definitely a, a very different kind of discovery from the before, like Voyager, that kind of environment. However, the result is still very traditional, right? You have the very brief, dis you know, information display for each title. And then we just depend on the patron to figure it out, the user to figure out what, which one they want. So I think uh, it's a very, I'm just gonna pretend I'm a very, uh, a little bit lazy, maybe, I'm not really lazy, more like inexperienced user. 
And I was just like, oh, Lord, how come there are so many results? How am I supposed to feel so, you know, how am I to figure out which one is the one I want? And is there something that I can, I can use it later, but not for now, for different purposes, maybe. So that made me wonder is that, you know, is there something that we can really do with our data rather than just simply display the, the mark field in a very traditional way? And so I started to dig into the bibliographic records. And here are some of the first blocks that shows that the two records are really the like Emily Bronte's work. And, you know, of course, very obvious they have a Bronte there, but for the kind of inexperienced user, they might look at that, but why, why they are two kind of additional contributors, what, 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 what is this about? So these are actually two, two editors, right? So each work has a different, I should say each manifestation has a different kind of editor or expression, a different editor. And when we look at the beep of um, also uh, the beep records, actually there's a 758 kind of work ID. And by looking at that, you immediately tell, oh, they are actually two same work because they, send, they share the same ID. But if you look at the second work, which is actually, there's a little hint to tell you like the score. So that's definitely probably not someone who wants to study Emily Bronte, you know, with Ring High original work. Well, be interested in, but they will pass up. Okay, but by looking at this brief discussion, uh, brief record, it's really hard to tell what is going on, right? So once you get into a brief record, it starts to give you more information. So, for example, the 700, there's a relationship that's nature to real to describe to express the relationship between this work and the original work. However, in a, and of course, there's a 776 to tell you that hey, this is there's other format that you can explore if you're interested. And again, there's a 758 to tell you that. If you know, if a patient look at that, oh, it's actually a different number from the from the original work. And the other thing is that, yeah, so yeah, the other thing is that we're on this, not really a, a kind of complaint, but so there's a kind of related title also kind of to express that there's a, another addition, to, you know, to show that 776 that there's another format. But when you actually click on it, it just generate a, a title search. Yeah, so it's like, hmm. That is a better way to handle this rather than just a text string search. Then the last one is another work. It's a book with my high. But this time it's also very confusing. So this time the the, the other author become the first author. Once you get into a record, you finally realize, oh, this is a play based on the original work. So but then again, the ID actually tell you that it's a different work. So that makes me wonder that whether what we have really put in the big record should really help the patron to really make this discovered experience a little bit better, right? Rather than this kind of texturing or lots of clicking, they have to put the click it into the record in order to see some stuff. So, so that just gave me a light bulb. Like, hmm, how about using the URIs we have really put in a record? And, and not just a bibliographic record, but also the authority data, because, you know, catalogs had been very religiously kind of adding those all of wonderful 3xx into the authority records and lots of them are actually you know they are author they are they are from the control vocabulary so they are probably some of them have already got URIs ready to consume and they are definitely more machine actionable right rather than text string search or you know number search that kind of thing so and of course they take advantage of a relationship designator with catalogs put in there to really express it rather than just like, oh, well, okay, so it just not do anything with that data. That's kind of a shame. And that just made me wonder that if there is something that, of course, we can reinvent wheel. Well, I shouldn't say reinvent wheel. There are something that Primo is already doing now, right? Like verbalization and also um, you know, deduce that kind of thing to help patients, but it's still very kind of very clicky and it's not really very dynamic. So that made me wonder whether there are some more kind of more dynamic kind of tools. And definitely there are some kind of example out there like a Google Knowledge Graph. It's a little bit clicky, you still have to search in order to find the card, but hey, it's step a little bit step forward than before. And of course the author card is something that's very interesting to see uh, that whether there's a possibility that would really use rely on query, that kind of thing and the display in a record in some way. However, I want to back that whether it's possible that even those kind of things can happen at first screen. You know, for example, I'm thinking the sky is the limit. I might think that maybe a cursor moved to a, a, a access point that have a UI embedded. 
maybe some kind of knowledge file will pop up and give you some additional information. And Windows pop up that has additional links that take you even further. Of course, this kind of technology, probably not really, uh, I'm thinking about more like, uh, now depending on the patient to click, whether the machine can be smarter that when people actually move around on the screen, then the server or the actual machine will immediately do something, do some kind of on the fly query, that kind of thing, based on the URI is already present in the record. So I'm glad that uh, my next, the next speaker, Stephen, is gonna talk about their experience using the AutoCAD. So I'm, that's pretty much what I have, but well, thank you for attention. And I'm interesting, I'm very looking forward to any kind of discussion. And great. thanks. Okay, hello. Let me uh, get my slides presenting. Okay, uh, let me know if you're just please someone chime in if there's any trouble um, seeing my screen or hearing uh, what I'm saying. So uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, the invitation to talk about the knowledge card work that we have done. My name is Steve Meyer. I'm the data strategist at the UW Madison Libraries. And we've, we've um, had knowledge cards in our library in our library catalog that are based on uh, remote linked data sources for a couple of years now. Um, so I just want to talk about kind of the philosophy behind this in the in the background and do a couple of quick demos. So first off, um, for just a, a, a little bit more about what we were doing in our approach to how we would work with um, linked data on our campus, uh, there I'll share these slides because there's a number of links in them. Um, but there's a there's a write up here. It's sort of a it's written by me. It's a little bit of a poorly written sort of blog post style thing. But it but it explains the philosophy that we have that what we were focusing on with working with linked data is not um, all of the efforts that are going on around bib frame. Um, all of the things around data modeling and reimagining sort of what the future of MARC looks like. We were trying to think about, given a world in which we have these identifiers, these URIs, where we can link to, to data in the outside world, what, what would that enable us to do in discovery? So that's a, a brief um, um, overview of the philosophy behind it. So at a really high level, what our library catalog does is it is we call I kind I sometimes call it a bibliographic description crawl or a linked data crawl. Um, this is kind of the flow of what I, what you're going to sort of see on the pages that that I'll sort of um, demonstrate. At the center, we've got our library discovery interface. Um, we're using a, a local search interface. We uh, but we are using the same feed, the publishing feed from Alma to Primo, uh, we just uh, are, are sort of listening in on a copy of that data as the publishing updates happen. And in there, we've enabled the LC name and subject identifiers to be present in that, in those, um, in that published data. So when that data is there, that means that it's accessible to our discovery index. From that, we're able to actually sort of resolve the URIs for the Library of Congress name authority file. Um, URIs. So we we do this and we do look at the both the um, kind of personal, uh, the main entry and added entry for sort of personal names coming from 100 and 700 fields and also from the 600 fields from topical um, name entries. We take those URIs, we go over to VIAF, and then we've got some code, um, which there'll be a link to if you want to, if anyone is interested in um, exploring it. We go over to VIAF, Given an LCNAF URI, we resolve this the VIAF entry, the entity in VIAF or that. And then from there, we can actually go to get, get to our sort of um, using VIAF as a data hub. We can get to a couple of other remote data sources where we pull in more information. And those are Getty vocabularies, Wikidata, and DBpedia. The latter two are both, you know, machine readable linked data versions of um, of Wikipedia data. So the concept here is, I like to sort of describe it as if we're gonna render a knowledge card, the data underlying it is sort of what I like to call a micrograph. It's a very small amount of triples 
that come from a diverse set of, of uh, multiple sources. So as you can sort of see, this, this looks like a lot of data, but that's just because it's in the N triple URI form. But all of these, this is, if you think about this just being a set of triples, that's not a lot of data that we can grab and render a knowledge card that sort of enhances our the discovery. So like I said, the, um, the code is available in, in GitHub if anyone wants to use it. We're, we use the Ruby on Rails framework for our discovery interface. So we've got a, a Ruby gem that we've also published to rubygems.org, um, but you can sort of see all the source here. So um, getting to some of these examples. Um, so let me see here, should we go start here? So one of the ones, uh, this is the, a book by Gertrude, the author Gertrude Stein. Um, we've got our typical library catalog display of all the information. And then down towards the bottom, we've got this collapsible section information for the, from the web. Um, we had a hard time coming up with a label for how to do this. Um, we've got a little explanatory bubble that sort of explains why, you know, what the source of this is. Um, but then here's where we render our knowledge cards. So the first one for Gertrude Stein, in this case, um, here's the description from Getty, and here's the description from DBpedia. Um, the one we tend to I tend to really like the ones from Getty because in the linked data model that they have at Getty, there are also, they do something that we, that we librarians love, they cite their sources. So while it's pretty tricky to sort of parse through an RDF graph to get to a citate, the semantics of a citation, um, it's worth the effort in my view, um, just to be able to sort of um, practice what we preach in our library instruction section sessions. So the information that we've chosen to display is generally something that we think will enhance or provide context about the author or subject of a work. Um, so we do things like say, well, we're an academic institution. And so it's nice if we can get, if we can sort of give the educational context of the author. Um, one of the other ones, Wikidata does include some citations for some entries, but this is actually one of the things that we really love about this, which is, this is asserting that Gertrude Stein was um, educated at John Hopkins. I don't know that she was educated at the School of Medicine. So that's this is one thing to note about this data that comes from sort of these remote sources. Um, but when we get this kind of a citation, we can actually <coughs> turn it into a link. We can actually then sort of rebroadcast that as a keyword search against our catalog and see, do we have this work? Do we have these items in our catalog? Um, and so that's one of the kind of great use cases that, that sort of really works pretty well. Um, the one of the things that is obviously very good is other works by this author um, comes in the notable works data from Wikidata. We do have some questions about this, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And then we'd sort of, um, DBpedia has these notions of like who was an influence on who in a sort of scholarly sense. And we display those kinds of things. These two things tend to be really interesting, though the provenance problems are something that we, that we sort of have talked quite a bit about. So moving on to another example, this one I really find super interesting. So this is a book about the mathematician Euler. Um, Euler appears as a subject heading um, in this particular record. And that's where we get the LCNAF um, ID that we can translate into a URI and go and resolve to get all this information. Most of this is not that interesting. But the notable works section really, really is to me. So one of our librarians in our special collections um, library said, hey, let's take a look at let's we 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 sort of pushed on um, this feature by sort of trying to go and explore and see what kinds of wiki what, what kind of data was going to come back for these people um, as we as we displayed the knowledge cards and we looked up Euler and to our surprise, we didn't find works in the library sense of things that we would have in our catalog. We found things like a reference to Euler's theorem, which is actually a, a super interesting concept because that actually, I wasn't expecting to see that. It broke me out of the notion of like the library centric notion of what is a notable work. Well, it's something that's actually published or at least in some kind of tangible form but not, I didn't think of it necessarily in exactly the same way as 
the abstraction of a theorem, an equation, or something like that. But these, again, we can take this, we can take these assertions, rebroadcast them into our catalog, and provide more context, um, provide more discovery opportunities um, based on the data that we're getting back. Uh, the last one I'll show, this is Michael Pollan. I think he is a professor and a journalist, um, and he is a fairly famous author on uh, topics around food. Um, so one of the other things that for more recent authors that you that we sort of thought would be an interesting thing to do is to say, let's let's pull back film appearances. So this is again, more information that our catalog data for a record about a book does not have about this author. What films did this author appear in? And again, rebroadcast that link and see that, look, oh, if someone is interested in this author, they can actually probably also find this film in our, in our collections as well. And so for these kinds of things, this is enhancing the record with data that our bibliographic description doesn't have. And that has really been sort of like the entire philosophy for how we've approached this. Um, I like to um, frame it around this phrase that's been repopularized recently by OCLC. Um, I don't think they're doing a good enough job of citing the original authors, as far as I'm concerned, but I went to the UW-Madison uh, Library School, now it's an school, and they, they sort of talked about this a lot. This, uh, this phrase that was coined by a, a former faculty member, um, Douglas Zweizig, um, the, this notion of the library in the life of the user rather than the user in the life of the library. Um, the idea here is that we should, situ we should sort of flip the context of what we would sort of normally assume. And so in this case, I think this works really good for a linked data um, context because I think of it as let's situate a work from our collection within all data about its creator, not just what we know. And I find that to be sort of very interesting. It's sort of, a, it's a bit of a sort of humility factor for libraries to, to sort of think we have these great catalogs. I agree that we have some of the absolute best, most robust description in our Mark catalogs ever, but there is definitely more data points about these authors that um, the rest of the world knows because we're focused so much on the um, things that are actually in our collections. So uh, this is the, that's sort of what we're doing. I do just wanna sort of end up with a couple of notes about some of the um, critical examinations that we've done of this data. Um, some of these, again, I'll share these slides, so feel, don't feel like you need to sort of read. I'm running at the end, up to the end of my time, I think, so I'll go through this fast. But there are some things um, we were very concerned about displaying Wikipedia data and all bringing all of the related controversies surrounding the kinds of content authoring that happens in Wikipedia and whether or not that allies um, aligns itself with the values at our institution. Um, these were some of the things as we were, were going through those exercises and just sort of pulling up knowledge card after knowledge card, thinking critically about what we're seeing, what is the data, do, are we really comfortable with this? I'm happy to talk more about this with anyone um, who's interested, um, but there are, there are some concerns that you should have and you should think about the data elements that you're picking very carefully, including those just general descriptions. Um, other times there's also just generally, we've made some general notes about just lackluster content. Um, things like, oh, you know, Wallace Stevens notable works missing the thing which won him the Pulitzer Prize. Or the fact that some of these data sets don't get updated as frequently. And so maybe something like Kehinde Wiley's bio lacks mention of the Obama portrait, which is a very, very significant piece of work um, for that person. Um, so we did actually develop um, a mechanism on our campus that if we needed to, if we found a knowledge card that had offensive content, we could sort of very quickly block it from display, kind, um, kind of add its ID into a sort of non-display list. And we, we thought that we would have to do that for some of these issues um, around sort of bias and uh, quality of content. One of the, the one thing that came up that we, that recently that um, sort of surprised us was that we had an author of a book, um, one of our own faculty members in our medical school, looked up, looked up his own work in the catalog 
and the knowledge card said he's dead, in which case he got in touch with the medical library and told us he certainly was not dead. Um, and this was a case where there is a mix match, mismatch in the algorithmic merging of data that comes uh, to people with the same name, same profession on the VOF side that we um, that we noticed the assert the same as assertion. Um, I'm not sure exactly which which um, uh, which ontology it came from, but it simply is wrong. And so there are these things that you do want to think about, and you do want to think about the sort of mitigation strategies if you go forward with with something like this. So launching launching the feature in your catalog, you're probably not done simply by doing it, but you have to have you have to be ready to respond to the data. So that's it for what I've got to talk about. I will stop sharing and turn it over to the last presenter. Okay, uh, thank you, Steve. Um, uh, I'm Katie Lam uh, from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Today, I will uh, mainly demonstrating uh, the linked data capability of our institutional repository is different from the Elmer Primo <laughs> uh, library catalog, some discount thing. It, but the uh, institutional repository, this set of data is actually quite important in the library and they share lots of the common uh, uh, characteristics of map record, of bibliographic records and so on. So uh, uh, let's start. Um, our Institutional repository, uh, we call it SPD. Uh, actually, it's not just uh, the research output. We also have profile of our faculty members. Uh, you can consider this as an authority record of the author of the research output. And uh, uh, in last year, we start also harvesting uh, funding data, funding information from Web of Science and also open access policy data from uh, Serpa Romeo. So when we are we, when we are doing this harvesting, uh, we took the opportunity to reram the data set and convert it into uh, linked data. We hope that by having it in more structured linked data with uh, URIs and all this actionable link uh, will make the institutional repository more discoverable and so on and so forth. So uh, we decided to use schema.org, uh, which is actually a very popular vocabulary for structured data. Lots of people are using it and uh, it's an open community uh, developed uh, uh, project uh, and uh, attempts to cover everything. So this is quite good. Um, so uh, these are the schema dot odd types that's being used in the SPD. And uh, uh, this is uh, some of the statement. For example, uh, this URI, the research output, uh, has an offer uh, of uh, a, another of the profile of a faculty profile. So another URI. So the property here is the schema property. And these are the work, uh, the types uh, in schema.log. Uh, these are the capability, linked data capability currently implemented in uh, uh, SPD. I will start uh, showing, uh, uh, demonstrating this, uh, these features. First of all, uh, I uh, mentioned that we have uh, used schema.org to model the, the data. Uh, we actually uh, uh, Find uh, use the only schema dot uh, in the in 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 the schema in 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 the uh, data uh, for all these uh, types, and uh, we build a triple store and uh, we make it link the open data so that machines can go in uh, uh, openly uh, and using the Sparkle query to retrieve uh, whatever triples they want to uh, the machine want to retrieve. And uh, in order to help uh, people, <laughs> human beings, to understand uh, all this, uh, we created this, this uh, Sparkle query form. 
So uh, show cases, uh, use uh, use cases to uh, show how we can construct the Sparkle query and in different perspective and so on and so forth. So there are lots of use cases here. Uh, and for example, if we want to retrieve the, uh, the all the triples uh, of a graph of a research output, we just uh, copy and paste here and go. Then the program will construct the Sparkle query, which is here, and then run the command, run the query, and retrieve the triples uh, related to this uh, research output, this graph. This graph okay? uh, you can view it in table form, but uh, if you want, you can look at it in a more interesting way, visualize it. And uh, here you are. This is the uh, research output in linked data using the schema uh, dot op uh, vocabulary. And you can see from here, uh, there are two offers. And uh, also uh, is, uh, for example, uh, uh, is part of the of the, uh, where's the, uh, it's part of this uh, issue, journal issue, and this journal issue is part of this journal, and this journal actually have a Romeo uh, open access policy data in it. So like if you click on the uh, double click, you will retrieve the graph of this author, of this profile. And uh, you see that, uh, uh, he actually has a YG data item uh, with the queue number uh, harvested into, into the profile uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, let's go back. Uh, if you click on this uh, Romeo, uh, you see the uh, model, modeling of the Romeo data, the policy data uh, in schema.org uh, and all, all this kind of thing. Okay, let's go back. Uh, we finished that part uh, of uh, uh, Sparkle curing thing. Uh, for the discovery uh, in the front end user interface, uh, let me go to another slide. We actually embed the uh, linked data uh, in schema.org uh, in the format of JSON LD into the web page, the web page. Uh, of the item or the profile. Uh, this uh, will help the search engines to understand the content more easily because it's structured. It. And uh, uh, we, uh, by doing so, there's a higher chance that the search engine will be able to rank uh, the page at a higher position uh, in the search results. So this is what we call the search engine optimization. Uh, another discovery thing we bring in enrich the data as long as uh, we find it in the linked data. Uh, for example, uh, uh, these two pieces of information, the funding information and the open access article icon actually are populated or enriched uh, from the JSON-LD uh, and so on. Another discovery thing, uh, when, we, when you retrieve a, a profile, uh, uh, it actually will go to the uh, issue a Sparkle query uh, to the triple store to, to retrieve the, the data related to the timeline, to the publication timeline and generate this chart. Uh, so let's see it Click on this po profile. Then you will see that it try to crunch and then immediately retrieve the, metadata, uh, the linked data. Uh, from the triple store to formulate, to create this. So we bring in data from, 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 from uh, the triple store to enrich the profile page. You actually see that uh, this profile, he is actually our past president, uh, has a YK data page, and uh, this uh, ID are actually harvested from the, from the YK data page. And uh, in fact, uh, we can also construct the discovery uh, with YK data page. Uh, let, let me show it uh, in a different per page, uh, in a different person. So this guy, uh, 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 
this is the discovery with Waikiki data. So these are data gen, uh, that we retrieve uh, from Waikiki data. Uh, let, let's go to this page first. So here we are and uh, uh, showing the Wikipedia article link where he educated uh, the award he has, he have uh, the doctoral advisor, his uh, students and so on and so forth. Uh, interesting enough, uh, when we do this project, uh, we uh, as a byproduct, by we're able to generate uh, 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 interesting thing, academic genealogy based on uh, the advisor in, in the Wiki data uh, database, data set, open data set. Uh, so let's uh, click and see how it looks like. Okay, so it generates this very interesting <laughs> uh, chart or trees of uh, this uh, professor, right? So uh, he is his doctoral advisor and he, this guy is his and so on and so forth. By networking uh, all this advisor, you build the uh, academic genealogy of this professor. Uh, you can find some way big name here. Uh, I don't know where, uh, for example, Kao, Ga, Gauss, right? And so on and so forth. Uh, you actually can click on the photo, double click on it uh, to go to the Wiki uh, Pedia uh, item. Okay. Uh, but this, uh, so uh, this is my last slide, uh, transitioning, converting the scholarly output metadata to structured data is just a small part of the, uh, the, the ongoing trend. Uh, of transitioning bibliographic metadata to linked data. And I think with this transition, uh, the new normal of our librarians, uh, metadata librarians will be quite different. Uh, Karen, uh, in her OCLC research report in 2020 last year, actually uh, have a very good uh, discussion on transitioning next generation of, uh, to the next generation of metadata and in this uh, report, the very first uh, uh, session is on transitioning to linked data. So uh, I, I guess uh, many of you already have read it. Uh, so my last comment, uh, the metadata librarian's uh, behavior or the, the way of doing thing might be very different after we transition to linked data. Instead of describing the bibliographic resources in uh, MAD, this kind of string based, you'll be using uh, linked data capable vocabularies. And uh, when you describing the resources, you no longer need typing the test string. You actually will do uh, lockup URIs uh, for external uh, linked open data sources. And one more is that uh, currently when you do authority control, you have to be very careful about the preferred terms or preferred name. But in linked data environment, you actually don't need uh, to have this kind of restriction. You should be able to assign as many URIs as, pos as you think uh, is, uh, is relevant uh, in, in, in the description uh, from multiple linked data sources. Okay, so uh, that's all from me for now. Thank you. So I'll close the sharing. All right, well, thank you very much, TJ, Steve, and KT for those, those presentations. Um, we did publish the, or did uh, advertise the, the question document before the presentations and a few came in and I've uh, noticed that a few were entered during uh, during these presentations, and I did copy a couple from the chat over there. So I'm going to switch over to that Google Doc, uh, which again is, um, no, sorry, uh, too many screens open. Uh, and uh, I'll just ask the, the, go through the questions in the order they were asked. Um, the first one here is, Given that much of the metadata for e-resources emanates from content providers in Onyx format, 
Should we be working with the publishing industry to enrich their content standard, which is a native XML format? Now we'll open that to any of the panelists that has the thought on this. Or if this time is all three of you, we can open it to the audience and phone a friend. Phone a friend, please. <laughs> if, maybe if the original uh, question, if, if the person who uh, submitted the question is here, I, I think I don't understand. Is it, it ask them to enhance with linked data in particular? For is there a particular sort of use case in mind? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, I'm the person who put that question up. Um, it's Jane Daniels here from uh, the Wales in the UK. Um, my observations on this really stem from the fact that um, we see an awful lot of duplicated effort in the metadata workflows at the moment. Um, so you've got the publishers using an Onyx standard, which is at native XML. And then you've got the knowledge base providers um, and the record vendors converting the Onyx feeds into Mark, which then has to be republished as Mark XML in the discovery layers. Um, this all gets trammeled up in an awful lot of duplicated effort globally. And it just occurs to me that um, could we be in some ways cutting out a lot of this duplicated effort and certainly doing away with a lot of the um, delays that we see and possibly the additional expense that all this entails as well. Um, I think we all want to see linked data used widely. Um, the presentations now have just proved that conclusively it is the way for us to go. But we are not the only ones with the metadata. And as a lot of the, com you know, the commercial resources that we purchase, that the metadata is coming from the publishers. So I just wonder if there isn't a good case now for us to sit around the table with the publishing industry and look at what's in Onyx, what's in Mark, and what could we put into Onyx that is derived from Mark so that we're not having to, to do all this kind of enrichment of Mark records. Is there a way forward down that? I, I think there is definitely uh... A, a, uh, an option that if the originator, the, the create the beginning creator of the content of the resources uh, can actually uh, do it in, in linked data in a format that is acceptable for, 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 for consumption uh, in the catalog. Uh, and by doing so, uh, we don't need to convert from one format to another format and then back to another format and so on and so forth. So uh, this actually, I think in the old day when we were talking about the CIP <laughs> cataloging in publication thing, uh, so we want the publisher to, to actually when they uh, publish uh, already uh, format it into a map, map format, <laughs> library, met, library metadata format and so on. So if we are talking about linked data, we probably can, can have this kind of initiative. I don't know about Onyx, whether they already have this kind of thinking that uh, to create uh, their data in, in linked data format. It can be in schema.org, it can be in BigFame, it can be any any format, any any linked data format, structured data, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll just add that sort of based on our experience using linked data, um, I, I have been coming around to a thought that it, essentially linked data works great as almost a lingua franca, a kind of, universal communication, which is, you know, given that the ontologies can be sort of referenced on the web themselves, they can be sort of, in some sense, sort of self-documenting. I think that the, the notion that maybe publishing schemas in an RDF form as a way to sort of encourage everybody to sort of speak one language in transmission and let give individual applications and individual data consumers their own opportunity to use the data modeling that suits their particular use cases. 
Um, I have a hard time thinking that we will get total consensus on a single sort of metadata format ever. Um, so I think it, I think going back to the almost on some level, the original notion of MARC, which is as a transmission format, less than, you know, originally, not so much the, as a cataloging format. Um, I think that linked data could sort of serve a function like that and enable sort of the communication and then the consumption, enable more consumption of diverse, discrete, remote um, data sources that can then be sort of put to, put to work in a much more um, heterogeneous data environment. Uh, it seems to me, um, I don't know what, what individuals or organizations would have le leverage with the publishing industry. Uh, um, that what we might aim for first, just as we're doing with Mark, is can data elements be introduced that would contain uh, URIs for real world objects or, you know, or URIs that point to linked data that has a relationship to what the publisher's publishing. That would at least allow better translation and more information to come through to the mark, which could then be transformed into Gib frame or whatever linked data um, uh, configuration schema um, the libraries wanted to use, or I should say the information organization wanted to use. Um, that that's not as good as having everything in linked data from Onyx, um, but it would be perhaps a start so that if our bibliographic descriptions are based on, on publisher data, whether it's Onyx or some other internal format that's been converted to Onyx or something, um, publishers that start to look at making it ready to become more more unit that more of that universal communication format like you're talking, Steve. <laughs> Thank you, Laura and panelists. I'm going to move us on to the next question because we have a number of questions and I suspect more questions than we can uh, actually get through. Um, the next one that was asked, uh, if I can just summarize it briefly, uh, is that if linked data is the basis of the semantic web, and that means that information is structured in a way that computers can draw relationships between resources. What then does it take for Alma or Primo to enable computers and people to work in cooperation? And what does it take for Alma or Primo to enable computers to draw relationships between resources? This seems like the one of the fundamental questions of the whole, uh, <laughs> the whole thing. Is it the chicken or the egg? What do you think? Well, so one thing I'd suggest is that it, with the with the kinds of things we could do with linked data in discovery, there is a there is a very very critical set of decisions to make about what metadata, what attributes do we want to bring into our environment. Like, and some of them are some are just very simple. What is actually relevant to a researcher of you know at my institution or my or my patrons? And maybe it's different for public libraries or academic libraries or special libraries. And so on some level, this notion, I, you know, computers and humans sort of working a little more cooperatively is, is actually saying, does cataloging become more of a process of algorithm design in how these, these crawls happen in the way that we're, we, we're trying to sort of present it today? How do, how, do you, how do you make decisions without knowing what you're gonna get up front? Because these are those those knowledge cards. While we cache them, they do happen initially in real time. And so, what are we comfortable with doing? And that's a I think that's a very interesting opportunity for cataloging and public service um, to sort of think about in libraries. Yeah, I I think uh, computer and uh, people uh, have been working together. Uh, 
for example, uh, in the old old terminology, we call computer aided or computer assisted uh, things like referral or whatever. And in this uh, newer newer approach, we we may call it robo advisor. <laughs> you know, a computer helping you to to to. Uh, something to do to some algorithm and then advise you in different types of things. So uh, in terms of Elmer Primo discovery, this is a very good opportunity for the computer to crunch uh, uh, the back data, the linked data, the data behind, uh, and then uh, recommend or advise uh, things. Uh, uh, in Elma, in Primo, in Discovery, whatever. Yeah. So this is actually the goal uh, of, of, of one of the goal of uh, this uh, linked data uh, approach. Uh, by by doing so, the machine can can interpret the structured data so that they can uh, they can add add on it add on it and do whatever uh, data mining, discovery, recommendation, or this kind of thing. Uh, so. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to summarize the next question, and I hope I don't uh, lose too much of the nuance of it uh, in the process. So please forgive me, whoever asked it, if I if I don't quite ask the question in, in the full way that it was asked. But in short, um, it, the, the questioner notes that Primo is very limited in what URIs or URLs it stores in the PNX. And these are mainly those that link to content somewhere like the 856 field. There is no way to capture the relationships to aspects of the description that we already see embedded in our MARC records. What can be done so that we can take advantage of these relationships and identifiers to better describe and navigate our resources, as well as access more information from other sources? to enrich Primo to become more than just a catalog list, uh, but a true research tool. Hmm. I'm sorry, there were no easy questions. Hmm. We've stumped the panelists. I'm happy to entertain thoughts from the audience. Ken, I, I think this is really uh, questions probably require a lot of thinking. Uh, maybe we can answer this uh, and then share the answers through the list serve. Then we can move to next question because this is a wonderful, excellent question. I think it does require a lot of thinking and to make a meaningful answer. Okay, um, yeah, we can certainly move along. Um, uh, the next, uh, is there anyone here using Primo's search engine optimization feature using sitemaps to allow search engines to crawl a version of our bibliographic records that contains metadata potentially in linked data format? Any observations on the benefits or improvements needed? This could actually be a yes, no question if you skip the second one. So I, I know at UC Davis, we, we implemented this feature, um, but it's by our digital application group. And I think I occasionally ask, um, did we actually attract, attract a lot of traffic from the web? I think the ones I mentioned, um, so far we haven't because there's a couple of reasons. One, um, most of our data are description they're not really contain the sort of like a link, uh, linking a way computer can understand. So that's why I think Google basically skip those most of the time. So, so far we haven't really had a very uh, sort of a good use of this, but mainly because our data isn't really linked data per se. It's just published as a linked data, but bunch of description. So King, as you said, is a chicken egg situation, right? Do you want to build a science first and then can be used, but then somebody wants you to demonstrate the use before you can actually build a build. So it's like, which one should come first? 
And we, we are at time. I don't, I, I think this is, this is a, I think a really important question. I just want to point out uh, Steve Meyer's comment uh, in the chat that uh, we should also think about what we want to do. So the advice is to keep the user story work going and to think creatively. In other words, dream, dream new features up. And yes, I think that's exactly right. Um, uh, it, it may be a chicken and an egg, but somebody gets to create the incubator uh, that, the, that we're, so the egg can eventually hatch wherever it comes from. Um, I, I hope I, I will invite the panelists to add their thoughts into the question document uh, after this session, if they have any, um, to try to answer those. And as Shaolin noted, we will share then the, the summary of that uh, out to the listserv uh, in a few days when we've had a chance to digest. And I welcome anyone on the panel uh, or in the audience to add their thoughts as well, um, either to the document or just pose questions in the listserv. That would be great. I want to thank uh, our three panelists, TJ, Steve, and KT, for their presentations and time today. And uh, thank uh, all of you in the audience for attending and uh, participating so, so interestedly. I think that will wrap us up for the day. Uh, we will make the recording available as well. And thank you again for attending today's town hall. Thank you, Ken, for the wonderful uh, facilitation. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.